This month's guest is Allison Kettering, who's going to speak about uh, Fred, primarily Fred Hagstrom's artist books and their connection to BEMA's artist book collection. So I'll just pass it right over to Allison. I'm really happy to, to see you all here. And I know that she's just put uh, an incredible amount of thought and research into this presentation. So I'm really excited that we can share it all with you. Okay, um, I wanna start off by thanking Annika for all of her help. Uh, I pestered her with questions and also Catherine Alice Michaels and Fred Hagstrom. Uh, Fred answered uh, multiple questions. My topic today is connected with my very favorite room at BIMA, the artist's room um, with Cynthia Sears' marvelous collection. When Annika asked me to give this talk many months ago, she suggested I choose an artwork that interests me. And she also uh, suggested that I give some um, questions at the end to facilitate discussion. And I hope you will participate um, because I really miss teaching and this is as close as I can get to it. I'll be talking particularly about the books by Fred Hagstrom. Fred is a former colleague of mine in the art department at Carleton College. And by the way, both Fred and I were teachers of Kristen Tollefson uh, when she was at Carleton in the 1980s. I don't know if she could make it to this talk, um, but I'll also mention her one other time uh, later on. Allison, can I just okay. yeah. yeah, I just wanted to let you know that Beth Schott is also here. Oh, wow. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, Fred will retire from teaching printmaking in a few weeks, and he will move to Port Angeles next spring. Um, he gave a lecture at BIMA and participated in a panel discussion connected with the wonderful Open Sesame exhibition at BIMA in March of 2019. And he plans to continue uh, the relationship with both BIMA and the barn after his move to the Pacific Northwest. Fred has won many awards. His books are held in multiple collections and libraries, including the Library of Congress and the University of Washington Library. Uh, the books focus mostly on social justice themes, and I'll single out three of them. Deeply Honored, um, The Japanese American Exclusion, When Men Are Hungry, about the Dakota uprising, and that's on view right now at BIMA downstairs. And Passage, a book about the Atlantic slave trade. And I'll mention 1918, since we're still in the midst of our own pandemic. And then at the end, I'm going to put them all in context, in the context of the books which are currently on display at BIMA. But first about me, I'm a specialist in 17th century Dutch art, and I've published extensively on Rembrandt and the contemporaries of Rembrandt, such as Vermeer. Um, this past March, I gave a virtual talk about Blacks in Rembrandt's time at the University of Arkansas. And last month, I spoke to graduate students at the University of Amsterdam about 17th century Dutch amateur women watercolorists. I was drawn to the first subject, Blacks in Rembrandt's time, because of the recent attention by my colleagues in museums and universities to neglected or suppressed histories. I was drawn to the second, women watercolorists, because I'm a, an amateur watercolorist myself. Here on Bainbridge, I participate in two groups each week. I joined the Bainbridge chapter of Urban Sketchers to sketch outdoors. And you probably will recognize that this is the courtyard outside Bima. And that's one of my um, own watercolors to the right of the same scene. And that's Susan Jackson, who's one of the main facilitators of the group. And I'll mention her a little bit later on. Uh, the second of the groups is uh, Life Drawing, the Life Drawing class at Strawberry Hill Art Center where every Friday at this very time, 
models from uh, Seattle Pose nude for us. And um, they're there drawing this very moment. Um, that life drawing class I wanna mention parenthetically has been going on on Bainbridge since 1957. At Carleton, my favorite courses were first, Women in Art, um, where we had a lot of material with nudes. Here, Alice Neal's wonderful uh, Pregnant Maria. And my other favorite course was teaching the history of printmaking, which ranged from the earliest woodcuts and the engravings by artists in the Renaissance, such as Albrecht Durer, and also in the 17th century, Rembrandt, um, I'm showing you one of his etchings. And in the 18th century, um, we looked at the books of William Blake. And we, we got as far as about the 1930s. Um, but along the way, in the 20th century, we studied Kate Kulvitz. In the classroom, the closest we got to artist books were the books by William Blake in the 18th century. And in fact, Blake was highly self-conscious about making books using a technical innovation he called illuminated printing. He considered these books unions of word and image. He self-published and he self-distributed them. These were the direct predecessors to artists' books, as you will see. So what do we mean by artist books? That's not an easy question to answer. My own short answer is that artist books have to do with bookness, bookness. Um, the artist self-consciously focuses on the book form. It's not enough to make a highly artistic book. If you, uh, the book has to um, be an object that has its own visual presence. It's a work of art in and of itself. If you visit the current exhibition in the Sherry Grover Gallery, you see 40 books on display right now. And that exhibition is called Water Is. If you go downstairs, you will see the Breathe exhibition and you'll find um, eight books uh, down there. Most of the books on display at BEMA right now are code, are the code, uh, take the codex form. Uh, the plural is codices. But many of these codices take very unconventional forms, such as fold up works or boxes or, or accordion style books. Uh, there's an accordion style book uh, in the lower right, or fans or flag books or tunnel books or books within books. Some of them are huge, some of them are tiny. Many of them experiment with papers, textures, shapes, bindings, and most of them are highly visual with words kept to a minimum. About half of the ones that are on display at Beamer right now are one of a kind, and the other half have limited editions going up to say 25 or 30. When a press is involved, it's usually the artist's own press. As I was reading up on artist books, I learned about all kinds of disagreements and tensions, including whether the book should be situated within the craft tradition, where artists can become quite obsessed with process, or within the fine arts tradition, or somewhere in between. Often, the artist's book is a world unto itself. And Fred Hexter makes this point. So for example, uh, sculptural book works often have very little to do with the sculpture produced in studios. And in the lower left, you can see three sculptural, and I'm going to call them book works. Um, but some of these makers of book works uh, such as the two, um, Diane Jacobs, uh, who is the maker of the two in the middle there, which I'll come back to a little bit later on. She's also a sculptor. Uh, but the one in the foreground, Beth Thielen or Thielen, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Um, she's primarily a book artist. Fred Hagstrom makes codices. And the texts 
are extremely important to him. In fact, he sometimes begins with the text and then looks for linking images such as archival photos or prints. And in this case, um, this is a, an archival photo uh, from Minidoka, and I'll get to the story in just a moment. Um, unlike many book artists, Fred is not interested in novel bindings or experimenting with typography, paper types, textures, shapes, etc. The topics are what matter most, and they're largely about social issues, especially social injustice and social conflicts. Such subjects have a long history in printmaking. Kate Kolvitz is a direct predecessor, and Kristen Tollefson focused on Kolvitz's prints in the first of these show and tell Bima talks. And I'm really delighted that Kristen's here today. Fred states that he wants books to be part of people's lives. He wants them to change the way we see the world. He calls his books 10 minute histories because readability is so important. The story's impact must be apparent in 10 minutes. These are stories, he says, that shouldn't be forgotten. So I'll start off with Deeply Honored. Uh, this is the first of his mature books, and it's the first of the 10-minute ten, ten histories. And it's the one that is most closely connected with Carlton and with Bainbridge Island. It's in the letterpress and silkscreen process. By letterpress, I mean uh, letterpress is what we think of as the printing um, movable type that um, Gutenberg invented in the Renaissance. And um, so he combines these, and you'll see in all four books that I talk about, it's always letterpress and silkscreen. Um, the story is about Frank Shigamura, who was from Seattle. And he was among the many Seattle Japanese American college kids who were incarcerated at Minidoka in Idaho. His mother was a Bainbridge Islander. And so she probably kept up um, with people who were sent off to the camps from Bainbridge. And because the people from Bainbridge eventually ended up in Minidoka, it occurs to me that they might, that um, various people, uh, some of whom are still, uh, as you know, alive, might have met Frank Sh Shimagura and his, or Shigamura and his family. In 1942, Frank was allowed out of Minidoka to study on a scholarship at Carleton College in Minnesota. He was among about 1,500 kids, college-age kids, and Carleton took four of them. Frank spent one hour, at, I mean, I'm sorry, one, one year at uh, Carleton, and at the end of the school year, he enlisted in a regiment of Japanese Americans who fought in Europe. He died two years later in Europe in 1944. After the war, Carleton paid tribute to the 54 Carleton students, servicemen who were killed. They sent the Carleton uh, president and administration sent this booklet with the students' names to their families. Frank's parents replied with letters of appreciation to the president of Carleton, along with donations that they scraped together from their meager earnings. And the earnings were really meager. Eventually, Carleton people found out that they lived in a one room apartment in Seattle. Eventually, a Scholarship was set up at Carleton in Frank's name, and it still exists today. The letters between the Shigamuras and the two Carleton presidents are the text that Fred chose. And the Shigamuras sent so many of these uh, small donations and letters that actually one uh, president retired and another one took over. So this is the watchtower at um, Minidoka. And um, it's fairly um, typical of what Fred, Fred did with the uh, archival photos. He would take the photo, 
he would overlay it with its textures. Um, he would color different aspects to it. And then uh, on the surface, the top layer are the letters between the Shigemoras and the Carleton administration. Here's the process you can see more clearly. This is the photo of Frank and then uh, the print which appears in the book. So once again, he colorized it, what we would call today colorizing. He added color, he added texture, he left the graininess of the photo. And then over that, um, he uh, printed using letter letterpress um, excerpts from these, these letters between the administration and the family. Here is a photo of the uh, one of the coffins of the Japanese Americans who were killed. And then you can see how he transforms it. He adds color for the coffin. He then adds the, um, the text on top. And this one, here's the photo of the one time that the Shigemuras visited Carlton. In fact, it was the um, one of two times that the Shigemuras left Seattle. Uh, the first, of course, was to Minidoka, and the second was to Carlton. And they visited Carlton because um, they wanted to honor the first recipient of a scholarship. And this was a young woman who couldn't have continued at Carlton without the help of this uh, scholarship. And so you can see once again how he's added color as well as the texts. The cover includes barbed wire. And the flyleaf opening gives a mugshot, not necessarily a Shigemura, but a mugshot of somebody incarcerated at um, Min Minidoka, as well as her thumbprint. And Fred likes to think about the rhythm of the book as he makes it, with the cover acting as a door. The second of the books actually includes silk screen images on the two, on the front cover and on the back cover. This is the one which is um, on view downstairs at BIMA right now. Um, this one focuses on the Dakota uprising of 1862 in southwestern Minnesota that ended in the biggest mass execution in U.S. history. The Dakota, or sometimes they're called the Sioux, of the Dakota peoples rose up after being mistreated for decades by the US federal government, which had taken almost all of their lands. On top of that, white traders and settlers refused to give them food. The summer of 1862 was especially difficult and a band of Dakota men launched attacks against the white settlers surrounding the very small territory that they had remaining to them. It ended badly. Soon 2,000 were rounded up and 300 were sentenced to death. Although President Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, commuted most of their sentences, in December of 1862, 38 Dakota men were executed in Mankato, Minnesota, which is just south of Carleton. I'm showing you a historical print that was in a local newspaper and a, paint, a detail from a painting. In uh, both cases, you can see the gallows uh, with the 38 men. Um, in the print, you can see the, the troops as well as the uh, very curious bystanders. bystanders. Um, Fred says that he knows he has a friend who grew up in Mankato, Minnesota. And as a boy, this friend liked visiting the local historical museum where they'd installed a miniature gallows with 38 hanging bodies. And the kids would knock the bodies down and somehow then they would be um, miraculously uh, raised up so that the bodies could be knocked down again. Needless to say, this installation is no longer there in the Mankato Historical Museum. But this kind of print is not the kind of imagery that Fred chose for this book. Instead, 
he chose archival photos and he would often go very close up um, using the graininess, the grittiness uh, of the image to his advantage. So in this case, um, what he's showing you is uh, some of the um, women and elderly uh, members of the Dakota, as well as their children, who were marched 100 miles uh, to Fort Snelling, which is in St. Paul, it's still there today. And uh, they were forced into tents uh, during the very bitter winter of 1862-63, uh, and many of them died. So what he has done, again, is to take the photo, uh, to overlay it with texture, to give some color. In this case, there's no printing, but in the, uh, the book that um, the BEMA curators, Greg Robinson and Amy uh, Sawyer, chose to install in the brief exhibition downstairs, they opened it uh, to an image where you can see just how blurry um, the image is that he chose, and then the texture that he overlaid, and then the, um, uh, the text, which is about some of the uh, atrocities committed against uh, various Dakota as the, along the march. In this case, one of the mother's babies was bashed to death by a bystander. Uh, the uh, last of the images uh, or the uh, pages that I'll show you is of a leader of the Dakota, Little Crow, and somehow he managed to return to Minnesota in the summer of 1863. And then, of course, he was killed uh, for a reward um, by a Minnesota farmer. I wanted to juxtapose Fred's books against a typical history book on the Dakota uprising. Um, when you look at Fred's books without understanding uh, the larger context or understanding what he's up to, you think, well, this is just an illustration of a history, uh, a 10 minute history. But when you uh, place it side by side to an actual history book, um, actually published fairly recently, showing that same print, uh, from the newspaper, you can see how radically different uh, Fred's um, images, his pages are from the typical history book. The third of the books is called Passage. And this one is about the transatlantic slave trade. And the cover is the British slave ship Brooks. Uh, once again, he's included a, a silk screen image on the cover. He took his images within the book, not from photos. Um, but, well, actually, I'm going to qualify that in a moment. The main image that I'm particularly interested in is from Thomas Clarkson's an essay on the impolicy of the African slave trade that was published in the late 18th century. And then there was one other um, early 19th century book that uh, he took images from. The, especially what you see on the screen was hugely important in the abolition movement um, as symbols of the cruelty of the slave trade. And so what uh, Fred does is to take uh, the image, actually detail from the image, he colors it red, and then he chose uh, photos, old photos of people, uh, Africans who had spent some of their time in slave, uh, as slaves. If you look at um, this very famous image to the left, I've seen it countless times, um, you're seeing the lower deck and then the, um, the upper deck. Um, these are all in the hull of the ship, of course, and the inhumane conditions under which these slaves were transported along the middle passage. The middle passage is the passage from the west coast of Africa to either Brazil or the southern part of the United States. And so here is the, the detail of it. Uh, so you can see that he's colored red, a detail um, of, from that print showing you how they're stacked uh, in, inside the lower hull like sardines with just enough room for, a vert, uh, for horizontal um, men uh, to, to lie down. And then he takes this very moving photo 
of the African who'd spent some time as a slave. And he places over it a quote that he found in the archives. Well, Jack, you, your back is all covered with scars and sores. I, I see no place to begin to whip. Um, here's another one where he zooms even more closely to the uh, detail of the, uh, the inhumane packing of these slaves in the hall. And here is a very blurry photo. And I can't read the text, but I know that one of the other texts um, is about the story of Lot, who eventually was able to buy uh, freedom for himself for an enormous amount of money at that time, $350. The final book I want to talk about is 1918, and that's the most recent. Um, he published or he produced it uh, just last year. And of course, it's about the pandemic and it, uh, of 1918. And it shows a shift of emphasis uh, in these books. I'm not even sure whether Fred would call this a 10 minute history. In any event, it's not about, um, it wasn't um, motivated by Fred's interest in um, atrocities and suppression, but it was motivated similarly by his frustration and anger at uh, how um, we in the United, United States, in fact, throughout the world, have responded to our own um, pandemic. The book makes us think about how we've been repeating the same mistakes as 100 years ago. We have advanced medically but our political and social response has not progressed at all. So um, you're seeing four images from the book, the cover, um, everybody in the book um, wears masks. And the one to the right is from the back fly leaf. So it's at the very tail end of the book, uh, all wearing masks. And there is a sign around the shoulders of the right-hand woman, which says, wear a mask or go to jail. And I haven't seen anything quite like that in this country, but my guess is that somewhere out there, somebody made a sign or a mask that says that. Uh, in the lower left, you see uh, three uh, workers on the New York uh, transit system. The lower right are nurses with stretchers. And uh, here's the, um, the full page uh, spread of these women uh, transit conductors. And Fred, in his own voice, gives you some detail about the 1918 flu epidemic, which, by the way, killed my grandfather and several of my great aunts. And um, he, this is another page, a close-up of some of the nurses. He's colored uh, yellow, which I think works really well, um, one of the signs that's legible at the back. And he tells you about the origin. Um, he says it's not entirely certain, though I've read a little bit, a bit about the 1918 flu epidemic and um, many people think it might have uh, started in Kansas, but it was, the news about it was suppressed. And eventually that uh, news was reported by an investigative reporter from Spain. And so ever after it was called the Spanish flu. Um, the, um, end of World War I actually spread this uh, virus back and forth across the Atlantic. So eventually, of course, it, it hit many countries all across the world. I want to end by contextualizing Fred's books within the larger world of artists' books. At first, I thought I would start upstairs with the 40 books that are on view in the Water Is exhibition. They're so different from one another that I got overwhelmed and I thought, no, I've got to really concentrate on the eight books that are on view right now downstairs in the Breathe exhibition. Um, here, uh, the curators have, or, or I should say that for me, this slimmed down the context uh, to a manageable size. Um, the curators have chosen uh, 20 artists uh, whose books um, pay homage and uh, respond in some way to Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and legacy, and especially his legacy. So social issues of the past and of our 
our own time, especially social injustice. Those are the themes that you find throughout this exhibition. Fred's When Men Are Hungry at the very left on the Dakota uprising fits very well into this context of social injustice, oppression, and atrocities. A quick glance when you go in there uh, to this exhibition, you'll see that the most traditional of the books are Fred's, which is Codex, and one other, which is by Tia Blazingame, uh, which is an, um, I'm not going to get into it, but it's, it, it is a codex, a fairly slim codex. The most untraditional of the books are se several sculptural book works. And again, I'm using the word book works uh, very uh, deliberately. Um, in this slide, um, the two middle ones were made by Diane Jacobs. At the back is Summer Hat with Flowers, which, who's, uh, which is made out of paper ribbons printed with letterpress with slurs about women. And then the one um, that you see at the left, but in the um, full slide to the right, this is called Scheitel or Wig. And again, the ribbons are on paper. It's printed with letterpress relating to women's experience with hair, uh, Orthodox women uh, wearing wigs, and there are all kinds of anti-Semitic slurs uh, that you can see. Um, in both cases, it's clear that Diane Jacobs is really questioning what the book is. And I wouldn't have even known to call this uh, these two book works, but when I was first looking at them closely, Susan Jackson, who had been director of Bainbridge Arts and Crafts, wandered by and she said, I sold those two to Cynthia Sears. They're book works. And I said, really? And she said, yes. So here is the detail of the, um, the Scheitel, the wig one. Uh, and you can go into um, the exhibition and see what kinds of anti-Semitic uh, slurs there are. Um, the one at the right, that was in the right, um, is by Beth Thielen or Thielen, um, called Tower. And in this case, um, you, there are four books. Um, the curators have two of them open, two of them closed. When they're all closed and folded up, they strengthen the column of this watchtower. And the watchtower is at San Quentin Prison in California. And the poetry in the books is by San Quentin prisoners, women prisoners. The one that I find most interesting and closest in a way in terms of content to Fred's is by Tyler Starr called Identification of Cars Participating in Klan Rally 1965. And Tyler Starr, like Fred Hagstrom, is a printmaker. Uh, Starr teaches at Davidson College in North Carolina, and that's not very far from Alabama. And what he did was go into the archives and he found that in March of 1965, 93 cars formed a motorcade put on by the Ku Klux Klan in a counter -pro protest against the marches for voters' rights from Selma to the capital of Montgom Montgomery. Um, it's an accordion book. And when it is um, pulled out full length, it measures 19 feet long. But the curators of the show didn't have the space or chose not to. But what they did do was include the very last page which is not from the motorcade of 93 cars, but is from a white car which had been driven by a civil rights activist named Viola Liuzzo. And that car was shot up a few days after the March um, cavalcade or the motorcade. It was shot up by four members of the motorcade uh, who were uh, out to target uh, civil rights activists. Here's a detail. Um, you can see it folded up at the left. 
It starts off with the FBI report into the killing of Liuzzo. Um, the parade permit uh, is included, and then it ends with an ad for the shot up car of Viola Liuzzo, just in case someone in Montgomery wanted to buy it as a promotional. In contrast to Tyler Starr's accordion book, Fred's is much less about bookness. He's not an artist who self-consciously focuses on the book or rethinks the book. And he's certainly not into the craft of bookmaking, but he loves many aspects about books and he finds the book form perfect for telling stories. He loves the book's sequential regularity, how it constantly changes as you leaf through, as even as it retains its finiteness. He thinks about the rhythm of the book with the cover acting as a door, as I mentioned earlier, um, and the end sheet concluding the history. So it's not just a portfolio of prints. And just to remind you, he wants his books to be part of people's lives. Books have the power to change the way we see the world. Fred is sometimes asked why he doesn't digitize the pages and just post them online if it's so important for him to reach more people. But he's committed to giving the experience of turning pages to viewers. So in that sense, he thinks deeply about the book. That's the experience you have when you visit a print room or a library and you handle the books, often with white gloves. He's been captivated by that experience ever since his first visit to a print room. He also has found that his books are seen more often than his single image prints ever were. Prints stay in drawers, but books are handled. Because his books are owned by a huge number of libraries and museums, he gets messages back about the frequency which, with, with which they're consulted and circulated. The impact of his books comes from his interweaving of image and text, so that the images don't so much illustrate the texts as transport image and text to a realm that sometimes pictorial, sometimes both pictorial and textual. The two together create a charged mood. He embraces the traditional form of the book in order to communicate something urgent. He creates a total form of urgent human communication. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to open it up to questions. I have some questions for you. And I've got a few of these slides. I'll leave this on the screen. I'm interested in whether some of these books are more effective than others, successful even. I'm interested in what you think about the socio-political and artistic effectiveness of the images. And I'm also interested in your ideas on how the books function pictorially. In other words, the relationship of word and image in the books. But before we get into my questions, I'm interested in your questions. Anika. Yeah, of course. Um, I have a few to start us off here. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about, and I think, um, when I had the chance to look at some of these books in person with you and Catherine Alice Michaels, uh, one of the things that I was thinking about is um, as someone who's familiar with, uh, with Fred's work, was there anything um, in your preparation and research for this presentation that, that you learned that surprised you about him, his process, his art? Um, I got to really love the books and I got to appreciate them in a way that I, I, I mean, I had seen the deeply honored and the Japanese American exclusion before, 
But it wasn't until I really began to look closely at how I put together the rhythm of the book and then place them in the context that I really understood what he was up to. Um, about when men are hungry, I have to admit, I lived in Minnesota for 33 years. Did I know anything about the Dakota uprising? No, I didn't. And I found his, he's a Minnesotan, I found his involvement with that very moving. Read. Yes, uh, in your conversations with Fred, did he talk at all about um, how he went about um, engaging with the subjects of his uh, books? Did he um, interview people who had been directly involved, uh, that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a great uh, question, particularly about deeply honored. Uh, he couldn't inter interview anyone else of the four books that I've uh, shown you. But in Deeply Honored, um, he is very much in touch with the organization in Seattle um, that is connected with the exclusion. And he became, he's come out, he came out to Seattle uh, within the last 10 years. Um, and one of the uh, descendants was in the audience in the front row. Uh, he at Carleton, uh, asked the college to set up a room in the former student union with the photos uh, from his book and photos of Frank Shigemura. So yes, um, his involvement with present day people um, is very much um, alive uh, today. If no one else is going to jump in, I have another question, which is just um, that I'd love, Allison, to hear a little bit more about um, your perspective, especially as sort of art historian um, and teacher around uh, sort of what, how Fred and other, um, other artists who make books or who make artist books uh, interact with sort of the archive and this um, historical content that I think, um, I don't know, I just, especially uh, with When Men Are Hungry, I think about all the photos that exist in archives and like universities somewhere that are really hard to uh, sort of untangle stories from unless you're, you're someone there with the knowledge, with the access. I don't know if you want to speak a bit about that. Well, I can't speak very much to the photographs because um, you have to remember that I am a, um, I'm an early modernist and that word is used for people who are specialists in the Renaissance and the Baroque. And, um, but what we do is similar to what Fred does um, in that we go into archives uh, looking for scraps of paper that might um, tell you something. And in fact, my next uh, article is going to be about um, a, uh, a, an amateur woman watercolorist who um, made a drawing of two black African kids. Uh, and she called it afterlife. She labeled it afterlife. And I'm trying to find out whether there were some African, there was an African family in her community. And so when the pandemic is over and I'm able to go back to the Netherlands, I will go to her town and look in the archives for anything that's going to tell me um, the African presence uh, in her little community. But um, I wanted to say something else. Um, I've heard several talks by Fred and I've talked with him myself. And what is interesting is that he does not approach these books as the art historian does. Um, he will tell you the story, but he won't discuss what they look like. He'll tell you the technique. And uh, in the Q&A, for example, of the BEMA talk, and that um, BEMA talk from March 2019 is still available on the BEMA website. 
you, uh, there are all kinds of questions. There was a big Carleton contingent that came over from Seattle. There are a lot of Carleton people uh, who both um, are connected with Bainbridge, but especially with Seattle. And they pelted him with questions uh, about technique, about process, but he never ever talks about what they look like in an art history introductory art history, one of the things you say right at the start is, what does it look like? Why does it look like that? We start off with, what does it look like? So you're doing basically formal analysis. And uh, so I'm interested in um, any of you. That's why I said that I wanted you to think about uh, the word image relationship, um, um, what happens when you add color, when you don't add color, when you add texture, when you choose blur rather than crisp photos. It's that kind of thing that eventually, as I was, I've been working on this talk for maybe two months, um, maybe a little bit longer. And eventually I began to understand that and you could see in my talk that I come to some conclusions, but it's not, I think that uh, other people might have other ways of looking at these, answering the question, what, what does it look like and why does it look like that? The why it has to do with how the different parts relate to one another. Did that answer your question, Annika? I think it did. Um... I think I was also thinking a lot about the the use of color and how adding color, uh, I feel like these images are very alive. I guess that's what I get, um, especially when looking through the books in person and, and something about recolorizing them, I think um, quite like effectively uh, brings them into the present in a way, you know, you can look through like old black and white photos and think, oh, that's like a long time ago. It doesn't really matter. Um, but especially his choice of color, like the reds and the, you know, things that really tear at your emotions a bit. Yeah. Um, and that's why I, I wanted to show a book, uh, a regular history book. Um, that is so radically different from what, or rather Fred's is so, his books are so radically different from an, or just an ordinary history book on the Dakota uprising. It looks like Jill might have a question or comment. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't sure how to, to oh. step in here. Hi, Jill. Um, Jill yeah. is from the Bainbridge Sketchers group. <laughs> there are quite a number of you from the Bainbridge Sketchers group. Uh, so Jill, yes. Alice and I enjoyed the talk. Oh, uh, yeah. it, I, I, I kind of had two things, one partly answering you. I think it is extremely effective, his adding color. Uh, it, it both hits you emotionally and it draws your attention to different aspects than if you just saw that black and white photo or grainy sepia color from the past. I, I think my other question, though, is if you have any thoughts on this, is how, why an artist chooses this, why Fred in particular chooses this medium? Um, because I'm struggling with the idea of trying to get this kind of message out to larger numbers of people and yeah. a very personal aspect of reading a book. And, and then those seem in conflict, but I... I, so I don't know how to ask the question, but that's you, what I'm talking have, about. Though, um, and this is a question that he gets in every single Q&A. And I don't know if I can really answer it because he doesn't really answer it, except to say that he, it goes back to his very first experience of being in a print room. Um, he loves that contact with prints. And I forgot to say that one of the things you get when you go into a print room is, um, and my group would go in and they would have, we would, they would pull the prints out from these stacks and we would see them without any glass right in front of us. 
uh, we were told if we had a cold, you know, don't sneeze because it's going to hurt the print. And it's that experience. He, wherever he goes, he goes to the print room um, and he looks at uh, the prints. He's a printmaker. And so in that close personal engagement of turning the pages, if they'll allow it, um, that's what it's all about. And it's, it's an emotional attachment. Uh, and that's why I said towards the end that, you know, he could put these things online. Um, I could not find most of them online. You can go to Vamp and Tramp, which is a distributor of artist books, but they only have a few examples. He could do that, but he wants you to ask, say, the curator at BIMA, can I see Fred Hagstrom's books? And can you let me touch them? And Catherine Alice Michaels did allow me to touch them, actually. I think, I don't think I had, did we have uh, white gloves on? I don't think we did. No, we did. <laughs> but let me tell you that at the Rijksmuseum or the Library of Congress, you would have white gloves on. So that's as close as I can get. No, I think you did answer the question because I, I, think, I think the answer is that he wants it to be deeply personal. And, and so that book form, which is that personal, is the way you reach that level. Um, um, I want to also add something that he said at BIMA in the Q&A. He said that he just got tired of trying to peddle his prints and then have them get lost, never to be seen again, he said. But his books are going into these public, often public, sometimes private public collections. And, um, and then he admitted it's a lot easier <laughs> to get the <laughs> books placed uh, in the collections. That was a, a moment. I'm, I did not ask Fred to this Zoom talk because I wanted to say something like that. <laughs> and he'll, he'll see the recording, um, but I wanted to be free. He, he said it publicly, um, but maybe he was sorry. I don't know whether he was sorry he admitted <laughs> it. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Jill. Thank you. Anybody else? Now we're just reaching our last few minutes here. So any last questions, comments? I have a question, or yeah, I have a question. Hi. Hi. I'm Annika's mom. Just oh, hi. Are wondering why we have the same last name. But hi, mom. Oh, right. You're in Santa Cruz. Yeah, right? good memory. And I see uh, you at meditation sometimes. Yeah, and I taught at UC Santa Cruz at one point in my long career. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, anyway. My, my question is, I've only been lucky enough to go in the book room once. And when I, I'm curious how you might help me define book art when I try to explain it to other people. Like how do artists or art historians I found it very difficult to say, this is what, and also there's such a range of, of stuff. I didn't want to sound like it's just scu all sculptural, like taking the form of a book and turning it into something, because that seemed really simplifying what I saw and what you're showing today too, even with the focus on Fred's work, it's, there's a lot of variety. So how do you explain this to people who don't know about it? <laughs> Well, this, um, I've read several books now, and I was puzzled myself. <clears throat> I've been going, I'm sorry, my voice is going just at the wrong moment. Um, I've been puzzled by that, and um, it, it, there are all kinds of uh, definitions. But the one that I came upon that encapsulated it is bookness. It, they're about book, it's bookness. But then on the other hand, Fred Hagstrom's codices do not tackle that issue. They're not questioning the book, but a lot of book artists are really pulling the book apart. They're transporting it to some other realm. Uh, and it's a world unto itself. And it's a growing, ever growing world that only started in the 1970s or 80s. So my history of printmaking class, we stopped in the 1930s. Um, the, as I said, the closest we ever got were um, Blake's books uh, from the 18th century. And so even 15 years ago, I can remember 
um, my, the last time I taught history of printmaking at Carleton, I said, well, maybe we can sneak some artist books in. And then I talked with the curator um, and Carleton owns some, uh, including um, Fred's. And she said, no, I don't think, he, I don't think so. Um, you stop in the 1930s, you, you don't go that far. It's, it's new and it's entirely different from just a portfolio of prints or uh, a nicely put together uh, book by an artist. That's not really what um, an artist is. An artist book is, even the terminology uh, is controversial. Do you call it artist books? And so eventually um, I settled on artist books and then I had to decide where the apostrophe goes. It's, there are tensions and disagreements and hatreds. <laughs> I'm not gonna go into those. I just said, no, I can't get into this at all. Um, but it's, it's a very big field. Uh, and so Sheila, you want to ask a question. Uh -huh. Well, I just want to say that I've been fascinated by this. Um, thank you so much for your um, your type. You're you're describing all of these wonderful books. It was fantastic. I, I make my way over to Bema, perhaps even this afternoon. Um, but anyway, uh, my brother uh, had a pit press, and and uh, for 50, 60 years, and um, sixty years, yeah, and um, he did not quite this, but he utilized different papers uh, on which he printed whatever was being printed. Uh, he did all the print himself. He, he um, put it together. He had his own cases and so on and so forth. And he had the round printed wheel and the whole, he did the whole, he did the whole book himself is what I'm saying from beginning to end. Um, the one thing he did do, which was sort of interesting, he did a lot of poems, lots of, of people, that came to him and said they wanted his work, um, their work done by him. Um, and he, uh, he uh, had the joy of having one of the play, uh, people, every, one, every time that a person came to him like that, they had to come and set, set one of the pieces uh, in the book. And uh, his press was the Flo Loris Press, Ian Robertson. And it's, um, you can, you can Google it and see it. I think it really depends on your definition, how expansive your definition of artist books is. In some senses, he was making artist books. And if you have a narrow definition, you would say, well, he was basically a printer mm -hmm. uh, at his own press. So it's somewhere in between. But I would be expansive and say, sure, why not? And that's one of those things that I think, especially looking at some of the the books that Catherine Alice Michaels pulled for uh, for Allison and that I got to sort of have a little in on um, the amount of really wonderful poetry and also like sort of humor and playfulness and uh, you know really fun like joyful asking you to interact with it kind of qualities that um, that artist books have and that that specifically the artist books that Cynthia Sears have has collected um, have. Yeah. 